This is now the second video on chest pain and how to move through your diagnosis of chest pain, be it typical chest pain, atypical chest pain. The reason for starting with a history and examination video of the considerations of cardiac chest pain to start with was so that you don't get tempted to run down a very simple algorithmic route for chest pain patients. For example, whenever a chest pain patient comes into the emergency department, one might think the temptation is to... Um, to perform a troponin on this patient and get a diagnosis of troponin positive or troponin negative chest pain uh, without a proper history of diagnosis. Troponin positive and negative chest pain actually accounts for a very wide spectrum um, of actual diagnosis and indeed troponin negative chest pain is not actually a diagnosis. It is um, something to help guide your further decision making and diagnoses. With that being said, it's probably now time to move on uh, to some of those adjunctive tests that allow you to enact a protocol on chest pain patients after taking the thorough history and examination focusing on cardiac issues. The first thing to say is that you're going to want to start to concentrate on excluding an acute coronary syndrome and this is where the ECG and a troponin comes into play. The concept of this um, after the history and examination of course is that ECGs and troponins can provide good detail in um, most patients, but crucially not all who will go on to develop uh, myocardial infarction or have problems uh, with ischemia within their myocardium, and such as ST elevation, myocardial infarction, um, other abnormalities within the ECG, a troponin, the high sensitivities of these now allow for monitoring over about three hours. Standard uh, sensitivities uh, allow for monitoring over about 12 hours. So if this is normal serial troponins. Uh, the concept of serial troponins should be mentioned because this might be important in the hospital that you're going to work in. The hospital that you're going to work in probably does have a protocol. So for example, patient comes in with chest pain, troponin positive, you will do a serial monitoring of this as per your department's protocol, uh, depending on the sensitivity of the, of the troponin. The second consideration um, of a pulmonary embolism actually carries on from troponin because you're going to still do a troponin um, on on these chest pain patients and if come back positive actually p is a differential of a raised troponin there are three things that can come back from a troponin positive chest and um, pain and they are an acute coronary syndrome they are renal failure because your kidneys clear troponin so it can build up if you're in renal failure or a PE. These are three things. There is actually more, but these are three things that you would definitely want to say in your exams if you had a troponin positive chest pain. The problem with having a troponin negative chest pain is that it's not neatly divided like this. It's many, 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 many causes. Some are serious. So it's not good enough to just say, oh, they have troponin negative chest pain, not to worry. There are many causes of troponin negative chest pain and some are extremely serious. And the one of them will actually um, follow in our third consideration. But back to pulmonary embolism here. Now, how one diagnoses this pulmonary embolism is dependent on the situation. You will recall that there is an S1Q3T3 ECG change. So the S1Q3T3 um, ECG change, this is a real common finals question. However, it is really uncommon in the ECG um, of somebody with a BE to find such S1Q3T3 change. So although you're going to say it to the examiner, you're also going to say this is an uncommon finding and actually the most common finding on examination or investigation of somebody with PE is a tachycardia. You should always mention a PE. Um, in your consideration of chest pain and you should also say that you would consider doing an ABG, a D-dimer, an ECG of course and a chest x-ray. A definitive exclusion would lie on performing a CTPA with contrast. So I'm going to go through these because if you're saying to the examiner you're doing ABG, a D-dimer, an ECG, a chest x-ray, they may very well turn around to you and say, okay, why? So ABG, you might find an oxygen deficit. 
You may also find the CO2 is elevated with a D-dimer. D-dimer is the degradation product of fibrin clots. So uh, D-dimer is actually very non-specific, but you should also consider a Wells score. And Wells criteria for pulmonary embolism should be used uh, as it stratifies patients for pulmonary embolism and provides an, e an estimated pretest probability. So you can then choose what further testing is required for diagnosing, i.e., a D dimer, a CT, and or CTPA, based on Wells criteria. So it's worth mentioning that the D dimer is based on a Wells criteria that includes the clinical signs and symptoms of a DVT. So if that's if that's a yes, you get three points, for example. Is is pulmonary embolism the primary diagnosis or equally as likely? Then yes, you get another three points. Is the heart rate greater than 100? Yes, you get another um, one and a half points. Has there been a mobilization over at least three days or surgery in the previous four weeks? And previously, have the, has the patient either had a, P, had a PE or a DVT? And finally, has the patient had hemoptysis or malignancy with treatment within six months, or are they palliative? And in which case, um, the the um, the severity scoring will um, advise you whether to go on and do a D-dimer or a CTPA. So worth looking up a Wells criteria score, and also mentioning it in your exam. It shows that you know how to how to properly stratify for a D-dimer. Next, then, if you're considering an ECG, the reason you're doing an ECG to XQP is because you would want to see if there is an S1, Q3, T3 pattern, uh, also tachycardia. If you're doing a chest X-ray and it's a bad P, you can sometimes see uh, wedge-shaped infarcts that sort of look like this on a chest X-ray wedge-shaped infarcts on a chest x-ray and you would also talk about considering a CTPA in line with your Wells criteria. Your third and uh, final major consideration that I want you to have at the start of your chest um, pain diagnosis protocol that you're going to get into your head is aortic dissection. And the take-home message from quite a lot of texts and literature would be that uh, unless you actively put this into your mind whilst assessing every single person with chest pain is that you're not going to diagnose it in a timely enough manner um, to save your patient's life unless you have this in active consideration. So aortic dissection, we'll talk about the character of all these um, pain um, syndromes in, in a minute but first of all I want to talk about aortic dissection in a bit more detail. So this unfortunately is one of the uh, troponin negative chest pain syndromes so it's troponin negative often the ECG is going to be okay blood's okay blood's okay um, as I said the troponin is negative sometimes you can see them on chest x-rays you can see a little bit of calcification around the aorta and, and potentially um, some signs but usually it's okay as well and if you're concerned you would have to order, organize a CT aortogram and then go to theatre. Now, all of these are life-threatening emergencies or can be life-threatening emergencies. They exist on a spectrum of, of, of emergent uh, care. So if we start thinking about acute coronary syndromes, which sort of... Um, exist on a spectrum from stable to unstable disease within stable and unstable angina. Typical angina is a heavy pain or discomfort that is felt retrosternally and it can radiate to the neck, uh, sometimes the left arm to the jaw. They can have atypical symptoms as well. There can also be issues involving aortic stenosis, severe pulmonary hypertension that we'll talk about um, in another video. But um, it's really important to realise that there can also be a progression of, of stable angina to myocardial infarction. And the, in this case, the pain typically comes on over a few minutes. Um, and although the, the pain feels identical to the patient's angina pain, it's often very severe. And it differs from angina by lasting uh, more than 20 minutes and not being relieved by nitrates. And you can see the patient might be sweating, nausea, they might have vomiting. And that's, that's very common in these patients. Um, and, and we'll talk about the clinical features that affect uh, the probability of it being myocardial infarction uh, in a separate video. So PE as well is associated uh, with breathlessness, increased work of breathing, tachycardia, cyanosis, and there's no bronchial breathing because there's no bronchial or um, or parenchymal pathology usually. Um, there can no, there can be hemoptysis and late uh, disease. Uh, 
And if there's a particularly obstructive um, pulmonary embolism, you can have you can have pulmonary edema along with um, pulmonary embolism. But this pain uh, is pleuritic in nature quite often, um, or sometimes it can be without pain. So this is another complicating factor of pulmonary embolism. Now, aortic dissection is is a pain that's usually very abrupt, instantaneous in onset, but has a tearing quality. And again, we'll go over this in another video in a bit more detail. But the location of the pain uh, reflects the site of origin of the dissection, and the spread of pain reflects the propagation of the dissection along the aorta. The, so the classic um, description of this if there is a dissection in the ascending order, it starts in the anterior chest and then rapidly, i.e. in under a few minutes, moves into the neck and then the back. Um, whereas dissections that originate in the aortic arch start at neck pain level and those in the descending aorta, the descending thoracic aorta, um, they're interscapular or have shoulder pain. And pain that radiates to the back chest pain that radiates to the back should always prompt a consideration of aortic dissection because don't forget the person doesn't actually have to have to have a massive aortic dissection to be presenting with chest pain that might cause cardiovascular collapse for example they might have small aortic dissection that's triggering this pain and that's why it needs to be investigated so tearing like quality to the back in different areas should really be excluded one of the last things to mention about these two before we finish off the video is that PE, you might actually see uh, the concept of ventilation perfusion scanning um, being mentioned within um, the context of tests for pulmonary embolism. These um, Q scanning might be used in, in your country if you're watching it outside the UK. It is not routinely done. Um, because CTPA is better, it's quicker, uh, less resource in intensive. Um, so the VQ scanning could be mentioned in your exam, which is why it's worth us noting it. And basically it looks at uh, the ratio between the ventilation, so taking the air in, and the perfusion uh, where their deficit would be. So the ventilation is okay because you don't have an obstruction in your airway. You have an obstruction in your cardiovascular system within the lungs. So there's a deficit between these two numbers. So you could mention that for completeness. But ultimately, all patients who come into the emergency department will receive or should receive if they're complaining um, of chest pain. They're going to get a chest x-ray. They're going to get an ECG. They're going to get their troponins done. And that might be serial troponins. Uh, they also might have a, have a CK done as well, depending on your department policy. And then in selected patients, you might want to consider ABGs, CT uh, modalities of the aortogram or the pulmonary uh, artery CT scans. They may get D-dimers, um, again, CTPA or aorta. Um, CTPA and D-dimers are based upon Wells criteria um, and they may have endoscopy. So the endoscopy is something we're going to look at in a different video because actually some chest pain is gastrointestinally related and we'll talk about that in a further video. If you like these sort of videos, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, leave some notes in the comments, let me know how you're getting on, what content you'd like to see. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.